So I guess where I'd love to start is, how do you approach covering and creating the story of the greatest singer of all time, um, who is larger than life? Um, well, um, <laughs> very carefully, um, Lisa Tommy, uh, my good friend, um, was hired as a director, and uh, she brought me in to, to write the screenplay. And when she pitched it to the studio, she said her pitch was, how does the greatest woman with the greatest voice of all time find her own voice? And she said she wanted to go from age 10 to age 30, from age 10 to the Amazing Grace album. And so because I had those parameters, it made it much more manageable. Right. So, But how do you, as a writer, negotiate, I mean, a young girl who's a musical genius who then goes on this quest to find her voice to then becoming the greatest voice of all time. Like, how do you approach that? Uh, by sort of, it was just constantly keeping in mind, it was, it was two things. It was, uh, I, I was very much paralyzed at first uh, um, until I realized I had to treat uh, Aretha Franklin, not as Aretha Franklin, the icon that I thought I knew, but as uh, a character in a, in a movie. So it was Aretha, who was a 10-year-old girl, who had this father who was a very famous minister, who was surrounded by a musical genius in her own home, and musical talent in her own family, and looking at this, and how, how does this girl, write, how, how does this girl go through life? So once I sort of took the icon stuff out of it and looked at her as a, a character in a movie, that, it, it, that became much more manageable. And that, and then just constantly keeping in mind, finding this, and trying to answer this question is, how does she find her voice? Right. right. And so on that journey, I mean, you also, you and Lizelle also really presented her. Um, so having two black women present this character, talk to me about how you approach this differently. Like, what did you want people to experience seeing this powerful black woman um, who came from great privilege, who grew up in the civil rights movement? I think, you know, I, I, when I came to it, I thought, because I grew up listening to Aretha, I thought that I knew uh, about her, but I, I don't know why I thought I knew about her, because I really didn't, didn't know anything. And so we wanted sort of the audience to understand her genius. And to really, you know, I just think that the word genius is something that is just, it's thrown around a lot and sort of very willy nilly. And for her to have grown up in this environment with three other siblings who were equally talented, who were all surrounded by, you know, uh, you know these, uh, uh, you know, musical geniuses, Count Basie and these things come to, who were all surrounded, but yet somehow she was able to rise even above that. Um, we wanted the, wanted the audience to come to appreciate who Aretha Franklin is as a person. And, and as a person and as a person who's growing and, and really finding herself, um, in terms of your approach as a woman, as a black woman, showing her as an, an activist, as well as an artist, showing her as a feminist. I mean, a lot of people did not know that she was so involved with the civil rights movement, so involved with the black power movement, and you know, very, very active um, in terms of her feminism, right? She had real agency where she demanded, as we saw, that men call her Ms. Franklin, and that she was, you know, negotiated a lot of her performances, and, and actually eventually became her own producer, which was unheard of at that time. But before she before she before she came to that, she had to she had to experience that journey for herself. You know, as, as far as her activism was concerned, I mean, her father was political. Literally, Martin Luther King Jr. used to come to her house when she was a child. He was he was mentored by C. L. Franklin. So activism was a part of her life. Activism was sort of like it was it was like singing, which was, and singing was like breathing to her. So that was just a part of her. And it, she just didn't. It wasn't something that she. Uh, promoted or wasn't part of her image. It was just it was just part of her life. Um, but she sang respect before she even demanded it in her life. So she had to come. She sang it 
and then she came to it, you know, and, and, and that was that was the case for sort of many of the, the things she 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 came to, you know, many of her songs is that she was she was singing through her pain. She was singing, singing through her joy before she was uh, actually ever experiencing it. And and I think that that's the power of it. You know, there are very few people in the world who, who have the who have those voices who can who can, you know, a voice that can translate through political affiliation, through language, through you know, through time. And and she was one of those. And and spoke to everyone at whatever intersection they were in their in their in their being. Um, talk about um, also being a preacher's daughter and kind of the pressure um, of that. I know you you understand that very well in your own life. Um, yeah, I mean, I understood it. I mean, compared to Aretha, though, I mean, her father was, you know, um, was very, very famous um, at the time. Uh, you know, King sort of came to eclipse him, but at the time, he was sort of the king of his time. So I didn't, I didn't have that amount of pressure, but I knew, uh, you know, I knew other kids whose fathers were, uh, had, you know, sort of prominent churches. So I'm very, sort of very aware of being under a microscope all of the time and, you know, sort of being watched all the time. And so you put, so you put that, once again, looking at this character in Maritha, you put this sort of, uh, you know, my father's a very famous person and then you're performing for all these people who are actually also very famous and you're, but you're sort of a naturally sort of shy child, you know, sort of what, 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 what does all that do for you? You know, and also at a time when, you know, women, as you said, you know, were not expected to speak out. Right. Um, so that is sort of a, an enormous amount of pressure for such a, a, a 10 year old child. Right. Right. And then also having <clears throat> to perform all the time. <clears throat> her father was very clear that he wanted her to shine and sing. So she lived under enormous pressure. Um, I think what's so interesting to me in the storytelling is you, when you see her kind of continue to blossom. So when she's in the recording studio, when um, she's pushed too far, she finds these moments. Um, how did you use those moments to propel her story forward? Um, because we wanted to, you know, um, it was very important to us that, it, that it not just be this biopic, not just be sort of this Wikipedia page where the, this happened and this happened and this happened. So that um, we were just very careful in, in curating the songs, that all the songs were sp speaking to an emotional moment of her life. I mean, there were so many songs that we had to, to leave out. The you know, the original cut was like five, it was five and a half hours. But it was, it was, it was <laughs> really important to just narrow it down to the songs that spoke to where she, where she, where she was, so that we're not just sort of hitting this hit or that hit or that that hit, but showing how all those songs were a part of her. Um, and also, those songs were a part of her, but then became a part of the fabric of the country and then the world. Um, what was the most, the hardest part of the script for you to write? Uh, the, the hardest part was. Um, I think cracking her relationship with Ted um, because uh, we really wanted it to show it to show that it was a real relationship, that there was real love there, that there was uh, real admiration uh, there, a along with the darkness, uh, along with the pain. That you know, um, to have that relationship be complicated and have the audience be really in invested in that relationship. And um, in order to do that, I had to sort of let go of a lot of my pre preconceived ideas. And once again, take this Ted White bad guy and, and, and look at him as a character as well. Right, right. Um, there's a lot of kind of power and joy that comes in the movie. I was just watching you watch her perform Amazing Grace in the back and, um, how were you able to bring that? Like, there's so much joy, there's so much power, there is a lot of darkness that I don't think a lot of us knew about, but how were you able to really show that in a way that makes people leave and feel so inspired, so empowered, so kind of joyful? Uh, uh, that's a really good question. Um, I think because you know, you're, you were invested in her from such a young age, and you, you know, so when, when she's, at that moment, 
So the goal was at that moment when she was, she was singing that song, we know that we've seen the 20 years of pain that she's letting out in that moment. We, we've seen that she's using that song, you know, the moment with Audra to heal herself and that she is healing herself and also healing others. You know, at, you know, in 1972, as you know, it was a very volatile political time in our country. And just, if you, you know, you've been seeing that amazing Grace concert, the way people sort of, you know, just the way people respond to that, and just even now. So it's, it's like, uh, it's, it's, it's the culmination of it. So it's not just, she's just singing, you know, the song that was, turned out to be one of her biggest hits. She's singing her pain. She's singing her joy. She's singing her healing. What was it like to work with Jennifer Hudson? She's 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 a remarkable. She's remarkable. I, I, I've I, you know I've seen several several versions of, of the movie over and over again, and I'm 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 just sort of constantly blown away by her ability to inhabit her. Um, you know, as you know, she uh, um, Aretha chose her uh, yes. to play her, and um, she just knew her intimately in ways and sort of was able to translate the language in her body and in her speech in, in ways that was really sort of uh, blew my mind. Uh, one of my favorite moments uh, was when I was in the, um, I was in the studio uh, watching Jennifer record and she, um, she, you know, she sang and, and Jason Michael Webb, the music producer said, okay, and now I'll uh, do it again, but put some Aretha on it. And she just sounded just like Aretha. Like I closed my eyes and I thought it was Aretha. And so that just that kind of, you, you just can't, there's no amount of acting lessons that you, you could do for that. You could only do that because she was with her. Right. Yeah, a lot of um, the cast and crew said that when, and it was the moments where she was singing where she really transformed into Aretha and they felt Aretha's presence on set. Yeah, yeah, I, well, you know, we, were, we filmed in Atlanta and so we used, you know, obviously, you know, local actors in Atlanta for extras. And it was when we when we were in those church scenes, it was church. I mean, people were there who were having church. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. We had to have uh, our 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 musical uh, our movement uh, coach Christopher Windham. You know, had to, you know, sort of pull everyone back so that they were moving. Period, as right. opposed to now. Right. Uh, right. But they, because they were just getting overwhelmed with it. Yes. Um, so the movie is out. You were at the premiere in LA last night. Um, how does it feel to have this masterpiece enter the world and, and shared with, with people tonight? Uh, it's terrifying, <laughs> eh, but it's also, um, I, I'm, I'm just really proud of it. And it's, and honestly, uh, uh, it's the greatest honor of my life. How did you bring your theater, your backgrounds in theater, how did you um, bring your theater writing to the screenwriting? Uh, well, Lisa and I came up together in theater. Um, so then this is, this is our, both of our first movies, you know, so we just brought that with us uh, because our collaboration, the way we talk about, you know, theater, the way we sort of workshopped it with the actors, we all use that. Uh, but one of the things I, I did learn early on was, you know, one of my first drafts, you know, the producer was like, you have 10 scenes and they're all interior. What is this? This is crazy. You have to, you have to get outside. You have to, you know, mm -hmm. just learning how to use the, uh, to, how to be more visual mm -hmm. uh, was a big lesson for me. Yeah. One of my favorite scenes is when Aretha and her sisters go to the park and they sit, because you don't see um, black women at that time depicted in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was very, very beautiful. Um, and also their conversation. Um, so those are those moments that I, that you did brilliantly taking them outside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where they were like, take her outside. I was like, all right. And they're outside. Exterior New York <laughs> park bench. Yeah. No, but it was, <laughs> but it was beautiful. Cause you it was such a New York city moment, right? Yeah. I think so. Um, so tell me, when um, when you're on set and you're working through, did you like theater? Kind of, you said you workshopped a lot of the script and a lot of the acting. Um, how did things shift from your original drafts to the workshopping? Uh, well, I was writing. Um, I, I was born in May, and we shot in October, so there was a very truncated period of time in which to write this. So I was on set because I was 
I was basically writing every every day. And there was just sort of constant, and God bless Jennifer and Marlon and all those guys who just were just going with it. So, you know, we would have you know a rehearsal before, and if actors wanted any um, you know any changes or any concerns that could raise them, and then while they were sitting at the cameras, I would do the rewrite and have the new scene for them. So that was also where theater and TV, you know, was very helpful to me because I I, I learned through those sort of how to write. Uh, in the moment and adjust in the moment and pivot yeah <laughs> so the next thing you did um, aside from the, the the shifting of the scripts what was the biggest change that happened through the the process of the storytelling were there any kind of surprises that happened where you all were like wait we need to shift or was everything pretty mapped out uh, no, um, I mean, you know, we had I we had ideas about things that were mapped out, but definitely thing definitely things would shift and change, you know, because Jennifer knew Aretha so 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 well, so she would, you know, sometimes say, you know, maybe uh, she would say something in a certain way or or, or change or th something like that, you know, things happen with actors where they get sick or something happen an emergency happens and you have to sort of shift. So it's, there's just this sort of a, a constant shifting and changing. And, uh, and obviously, um, you know, there was a lot that had to be be, be cut, uh, obviously, because, you know, there was just a lot of story to tell. Um, so, but it, yeah, it was just a constantly sort of a moving target. And you all, so you, how long did you, sh was the shooting period? Uh, we started, we shot in, uh, we started shooting in early October, uh, like the first week of October, and ended in March, three weeks before shutdown. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Was there, I mean, so were you like racing the clock, or was it just, let's finish? <laughs> no, 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 I mean, when we, when, we, when we finished, I mean, we had no idea that there was gonna, I mean, okay. we, we knew okay. about COVID, uh, but we had no idea that there was gonna be a shutdown. Right. I mean, we just happened to finish, you know, right, right, at the, right. You know, at the, uh, right then, you know, it was kind of. Wow. Very fortunate. So my so I love the movie. I think it is is spectacular. I think it's such a beautiful film, but it's really resonates with me as what we are going through over the last year of this racial reckoning and kind of empowering women. Um, I think it's such a great um, story for the world to see. But how advanced Aretha Franklin was in her thinking and how current she is right now. Yeah, because these, these political conversations were happening in her house. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, you know, she's, 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 her and her siblings are hearing these conversations. Her father's talking to the lead, lead, leading civil rights people of his day around her dining room table. Right. So this is, this is, you know, this is the conversations that, it, it, like once again, it was just sort of in her. Yes. And she, you know, she wasn't someone who would, who, who bragged about it or thought it was special that she was doing this. Mm -hmm. She just loved black people. And yes. I think that that has, uh, came through in her singing and, it, and, it, and I'm glad that people understand the depth of her activism mm -hmm. through this. Yeah. Ta can you just talk about her relationship with her sisters and how they were just such a grounding force and how you and Lizelle wanted that to be a, ma a centerpiece of the film? Oh yeah, no. I, that was one of the things I I, uh, I learned about when I was doing the research. How close she was to her sisters and 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 Carolyn. Uh, what, you know, she was that she wrote. You know, ain't no way, and help and her sisters helped her shape so many of her songs. You know, the the closeness of her uh, that she had with those sisters just empowered her and helped her to become the feminist that she she became. She, you know, they they were they no one knew their pain more than they knew their pain. And they, and because, you know, the singing back up for her, you know, it, it, it just, it was, it was a strength, I think, that helped her get through uh, sort of a very difficult time uh, with, with Ted and, and uh, you know, other challenges in her life because they were always, no matter what, no matter what falling out that they had, th they were always there. Right. Right. And I love just seeing that solidarity of black women. Um, Yes, they were her family, but they really held her down through, just through the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. We, it was just we, we just wanted to make a movie that celebrated black women and that celebrated black joy and black female empowerment. You just don't get to see see that very often. That's right. That's right. 
Well, um, do we want to take questions from the, does anyone have a question from the audience? Yes, in the back, if you could stand up just so we can. Oh, yes. Yes, she was amazing. She is a just a remarkable talent. Um, you know, that that moment when she, she says, um, how old is she? She's 10 and her voice is going on 30. And that is uh, absolutely true. You know, um, she's in, she's in, the, in the Tina Turner, she was in the Tina Turner musical, you know, before Shut Down, playing right. young Tina. Yeah. And... Um, I'm sorry. What is her name? Oh, God, why am I blanking on her name? Her name is, um, I just saw her last night. I'm sorry, I had a 5 a.m. flight. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking it up. Okay, <laughs> yeah, so my apologies. I'm just drawing a blank, but um, she, um, you know, we auditioned a lot of, a uh, lot of young girls. Um, many who had, you know, extraordinary voices, but she was sort of the only one who had sort of everything, all of it together. And to see her work with Audra was just uh, sort of remarkable. Um, you know, to see, to see, you know, Audra who had been, you know, singing so, for so long, to see this young girl who, whose voice is, as you saw, just a match for her. And a match, you know, um, we were very, very lucky to to uh, to work with her. And I'm sorry, I'm scrolling and looking. Is it this is Sky Turner? Sky Thank Turner. you very much. Thank you, Sky Turner. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, the Muscle Show stuff was was um, based on um, uh, you know a true story. You know that that was um, Muscle Show's band, uh, this you know legendary um, studio of uh, musicians in in this small town in Muscle Show's Alabama. You know these these uh, they were basically when they started they were all high school students um, with no formal training. And you know Percy Sledge and Eddie James and these these guys, uh, you know, came down there and recorded with them. And uh, Jerry Wexler realized that this is what Aretha needed. And uh, you know, we had the privilege actually of um, a couple of the, mu the musicians. Three of the musicians were alive at the time. Uh, one of them has uh, subsequently died. Uh, and they came and um, uh, on set and watched the muster show scenes being shot um, and you know did some some technical consulting on that um, but yeah the muster shows band was uh, the, you know they were, it was absolutely instrumental in uh, in Aretha's uh, the success of Aretha's first album any other questions well we want to thank you so much for just a brilliant, brilliant screenplay, and just creating this masterpiece. It is, it is stunning. And so everyone, please tell your friends. It opens on the 13th, and we are super duper excited for the world to see respect. Thank you. Thank you.